Welcome to this very special live episode of Troublesome Terps, the podcast about things that keep interpreters up at night. And welcome to a very special episode of the ATA podcast. Yes, you heard that right. This is a very special live episode slash webisode of two podcasts, the Troublesome Terps and the ATA podcast. Um, and I'm assuming you're familiar with both of them. And we are gathered here in a virtual live studio today, tonight, because, you know, it's coronavirus. So what are we going to do? Uh, so we're sitting at least two meters apart, much more than that, actually. But we have our usual fearsome, foursome. Ooh, who wrote this? Uh, anyway, live. Yeah, Jonathan, of course. Live from Ireland, first of all, we have Sarah Hickey. Good evening, Sarah. How are you? Hi, everyone. Uh, doing well. Still alive. So, so far, so good. Yeah, fingers crossed. It's good to see everyone. It's, it's the last recording we did, I think, before this whole thing started. So it's great to see you all. And beaming in from sunny, sunny Edinburgh. I don't know. He has the blinds closed. Jonathan Downey, how? Jonathan Downey, PhD. Sorry. How are you tonight? <laughs> It was sunny earlier. It was it was an okay day today. Day to day. I'm absolutely fine. Ignore the occasional cough. It's an old cough. It's not a new one. I don't have a fever. I'm completely fine. It's just the, phony, only, th- the only thing that is infectious of me this evening is my bad jokes. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> and lastly, he already started off the show for us, Alexander Gansmeyer, with the lovely lovely alps in the background it's just a sight to behold how are you doing tonight? right I, I figured in case people don't know where i'm from i'm just gonna you know be very upfront about it i'm good i'm very good but of course we also have alexander drexel joining us from the lovely city of brussels but not only that you've already heard uh, elena elena landon she is joining us from the ata from california i believe and of course, we also have Melinda Gonzalez Hibner joining us today, also ATA board member. Whereabouts are you located today? Where are you joining us from, Melinda? So, hello, everyone. Good evening to those of you that are ahead of us. Uh, I am in lovely Albuquerque, New Mexico, where it oh. is dry and cool, and it is 1 08 p.m. And I would like to correct for the record that my colleague, Elena Langdon, actually hails from the beautiful state of Massachusetts in oh, the wow. United States. So she's on the <laughs> other coast and uh, three hours ahead in terms of time from California. Yeah, it's just a few kilometers, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> just around the corner. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And uh, I want to give a shout out uh, to Medbad, who's uh, sticking in the background. But of course, he's the, the the brain behind the ATA podcast. That's why he's joining us tonight. So he'll he'll keep an eye on the on things in the background and make sure that everything runs uh, smoothly. And um, this is actually also the sort of the origin story of this whole affair is that Matt and I did a joint episode of another podcast called Lang FM, uh, where we talked about Matt's background story and then we thought we should we should have some kind of collaboration between the two podcasts because i'm assuming that many of you have listened to uh both podcasts at some point i sure hope so um if not then today is a good chance to sort of discover what the uh, two podcasts are about and i thought or we thought actually it would be nice to bring together this panel from Europe uh, and from the United States and look at the interpreting business from both sides of the pond, if you will. Now, of course, this was all planned before the C word happened. <laughs> so we decided to switch things up a little bit and turn this into a live streamed episode so we can have uh, you lovely listeners on board as well, which is going to be fun. So you can, um, as I said uh, at the beginning, you can already... Uh, comment and ask questions in the chat and we'll give you time to also actually call in and and sound off um, uh, for the topics that we have planned for uh, tonight but maybe it would be interesting to to talk a little bit about very simple things so how we all got started in the business because I already got this question actually before uh, we started the recording is people are really interested in seeing the differences uh, between the interpreting markets in the United States and, and over here in Europe and how they may work differently. So I don't know if anybody would like to start. Maybe uh, there was one thing, actually, Elena, that I that I thought was interesting in your bio, because you said you can make gringos sound like natives from a booth across the room or a digital device. <laughs> so what's, what's up with the gringo thing? That seems like something that is very specifically American, maybe. 
<laughs> yes, it is. Um, and I, I keep turning off my mic because when I laugh, I sometimes snort. And you guys keep making these bad jokes. So I don't want anybody to have to suffer along with <laughs> Mostly Jonathan, um, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know Jonathan. <laughs> um, yeah, so I work at Gringos is the, the sometimes pejorative term for Americans. Um, and if you know me at all, you know that I grew up in Brazil as a gringa, although I never considered myself to be a gringa. So it's a whole identity thing for me. But I, I moved to Brazil as a child. And um, so I was a gringa when I was growing up. But I don't consider myself that to be anymore. Um, but because of that, I have native fluency in both languages. So I can sound like a gringa to the Brazilians. And I can sound like a Brazilian to the Americans or vice versa. Yeah, and and um, you work with uh, mostly Brazilian Portuguese and English, then obviously. Yep. Yeah, and yeah. how would you describe your sort of path into the profession? Um, I started through translation, so I started working um, as a translator in Brazil when I moved back as an adult, um, and there was not that much interpreting going on there that I knew of. I started without any any kind of structure other than the person that hired me, who was the Traductora Juramentada, which is like the official translator, um, a system that they have in Latin America. Um, and I worked for her for a year while she was away. And then she was, was in the United States at the time and encouraged me to, um, as I moved back, I was planning to move back to the United States. She encouraged me to look into the master's program in translation studies at UMass Amherst, University of Massachusetts. and um, cut me off at any moment because I am long-winded. Um, anyway, so I came, I came back to, Mass that's why no I came worries. to Massachusetts and um, to do that, that master's. And then there started getting some training in interpreting. And we had a professor who had worked um, a lot as a conference interpreter and was teaching some classes, even though the degree was in a very different type of degree. And from there, I started as a community interpreter. So almost immediately upon coming to the United States, I started working as a medical um, interpreter. So at hospitals, um, clinics, other things like that, providing language access for Brazilians while I was doing my master's. And that's how I got started. That's awesome. Did, did that ring any uh, bells there, Sarah, the, the buzzword language access? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> Exactly. Um, and what about you, Melinda? So you work with English and Spanish and you work less in medical, more in legal. Is that correct? So, yes. Um, so my uh, process was a bit different from Elena's. I was actually a graduate student um, trying very hard to write a dissertation. Um, and my children started bringing home bilingual newsletters from school because they attended a bilingual school in Colorado. And uh, the Spanish was horrific. Um, so I asked at the school who's doing these translations and they said, oh, well, you just have to pass a test and you'll be able to uh, provide us with your translations and get paid for it if you think that you can do a better job, which I promptly did. And because of that, I was invited then or not invited, but informed that there would be a basic training for court interpreters. So I had no training as an interpreter. I was an anthropology student. Mm. Um, and I attended this training. It was a two-day training. And they informed us that to work in court, one needed to become certified and pass an exam. And coming from the academic world, what I understood was that I heard that exactly, that I would need to pass a test before I could show up in court. Uh, and that was my filter, right? My prejudice because of where I was coming. Um, in Europe, I don't think many people interpret without an education or training to do so, unless you're a community interpreter and you guys, as I understand it, although things might have changed, uh, include legal or court interpreters in the community sector. In the United States, it's almost the reverse. Um, the people that have to pass the hardest standardized test uh, with a pass rate of anywhere from 5% to 15%, depending on whether it's state court or federal court, are the court interpreters. Mm -hmm. And so, anyway, back to my original story, I uh, thought that one had to pass a test before one could go to court, but at the time, actually, the majority of people 
we're not certified, we're showing up and working in court. And I came into the profession right at the time when it was becoming mandatory. So I went, I took my test, and um, surprisingly, I passed it at the state level. And then I took the test at the federal level, and I passed that, and I never looked back. Um, I worked as a court interpreter uh, all that time. I also worked as a conference interpreter, and I also worked for the State Department when I was a freelancer. But I have just completed my first five years of being a staff interpreter, and I'm currently the supervisory staff interpreter for the District of New Mexico, for the federal court here in New Mexico. That sounds quite impressive indeed. Um, I, I don't know, Alex, can you comment on this? Because I have the impression that at least in Germany, it's quite similar with the federal structure uh, when it comes to being able to interpret and uh, translate for the courts. Because yeah. I think the, the requirements are very different depending on the federal state, I think. Um, you know, what, what you have to do or have to provide in terms of being, uh, I don't know, certified or whatever that's called. Can you, can you comment on that? Only very briefly, just because I'm, I'm not actually... I don't know if you've looked into it, yeah. I've actually never looked into it just because I don't like working for courts. The whole environment is just, it just scares me. So I never actually looked into it. And I actually use that as my excuse saying that I'm not a sworn interpreter. You know, I would love to do it. I'm so sorry, but I'm happy to recommend somebody else. But yeah, it works quite similar that every, that every federal state has their own regulations, has their own degrees. So if you're sworn in Bavaria, you're not necessarily allowed to work, for example, mm. the next state over. So in that regard, it's also very federalist in, in that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that's interesting, though. Very interesting. So how did you guys get uh, caught up with the, with the ATA podcast, since we're podcasting? <laughs> Elena, I'll defer to you. How did we get caught up in it? Well, um, I'm not sure, actually. It's Matt's fault now. Um, I expect I, we're, why he's on yeah. mute. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're, we're, we're one, of the, um, one of the interpreters on the board. So I think that was probably the main reason to have ATA members. Matt's not an interpreter. Um, so I think he wanted board members that were interpreters. Um, he knows that I am a big fan of podcasts. Um, mm. And I, otherwise, I don't know why, what I'm doing here, but... <laughs> <laughs> Neither really. to me. Sorry, sorry. Did I say that right? <laughs> well, no. I think uh, what the way it was presented to me is that uh, you were interested in having sort of a, a conversation about the differences um, mm. between um, Europe and the United States and other places, of course, around the world, because I'm sure this podcast is heard everywhere. And uh, just as a slight correction, for example, what we mean in the United States when we say federal is that it applies to every state of the union, mm. uh, which is why it's a much more rigorous exam and it's very hard to pass. Mm. Um, Uh, uh, and the way, because the way you were talking about federalism was actually to differentiate that every state has a different test. Whereas here, yes. when you say yeah. federal, it things, means yeah. this is different. the one. This is the one uh, for all 50 states. And mm -hmm. uh, if you want to work in a federal court, you have to pass a test that's valid everywhere. Whereas at the state level, it's a less rigorous exam. Uh, and you are only authorized to work in that state that conferred you that certification. So there's already differences. Um, in the United States, for example, and I understand, Alexander, that you don't like working in courts because it's scary. Um, <laughs> court work is actually a staple for interpreters that are freelancers, those that can get certified um, because the certification is not available in every language. It's a staple because the rates are set. Mm. You don't have to fight for them. Uh, the pay is secure. It's an institutional mm. client, not a private client. Uh, the working conditions are very stable. Uh, there's rules about having team interpreting after so much time. Mm. Um, courthouses such as my own have conference equipment, so I don't even get close to the defendants. And I'm on a loudspeaker when I interpret consecutively for the record. Mm. And simultaneously, the defendants use equipment. So working conditions tend to be um, pretty solid across the board. Not everywhere, and Elena is going to correct me because probably in Massachusetts at the state level it doesn't work that way, but at the federal mm. it does. Um, mm. The federal rates uh, are valid across the United States, and as staff positions go, um, they're pretty highly paid. They start around $90,000 a year. They go up to about $140,000 a year, which is um, a very good rate with, with, with benefits. So um, I think We're set up a little bit differently. Um, 
like I said, the pass rate is very low. Medical interpreting uh, started testing much more recently. Uh, the way that they set up their certification, and Elena can talk to this, uh, is a bit different from what they did in the courts. So the standards are different, the pass rate is different, and the pay rate is very different. Mm -hmm. And in the United States, if you're a freelancer, you really want to maximize, as I'm sure in Europe, mm -hmm. You want to maximize your opportunities to work in different fields and in different segments of the market in order to stabilize your income. Hmm. Um, so, anyway. Yeah, I'll if I can just Elena jump in there up. just real quick Please and then do. we'll, we'll do. let Elena reply. But I'm getting the impression that the, that the borders are much more porous, shall we say, between the different sort of segments in the interpreting market. I get the impression in Germany there's a very strict separation between conference and you know, public mm. service and maybe legal. Um, but we'll, we'll throw it to Elena first to, to comment on this. Yeah, definitely. The, the It's a lot more porous in terms of the, between you know, working medical court or legal um, educational now, which is re really on the rise in the United States. So mm. working in the school systems um, for students and especially their families, that's a really big one. And then conference interpreting or business interpreting. Um, mm. There is, you know, and then I would, yeah, I would say in terms of the federal versus the state, um, there, yeah, there are really big differences. I mean, each state does their own thing. Um, s many of the states are part of a consortium for testing and certification. Mm -hmm. Then many are not. Um, and and it, it, you know, how to, for example, in Massachusetts, they're not, I think they are part of the consortium, but they're not testing. They haven't tested in years. And you get paid less if you're not certified. And so, for example, I've been, you know, people keep recommending that I go to Rhode Island to get certified in Rhode Island, and they'll accept it here in Massachusetts. And it's just because the office um, ha for, is not testing, has not been testing for a while. The pay for state uh, courts is not what it is at federal at all, um, and it also is going to vary a lot. So when I first moved here, I talked to someone in Connecticut, because I'm, I'm in Massachusetts, but I'm on the border with Connecticut. Mm. And, um, and I, I, you know, I was interviewing her for a project that I wanted to do for my master's, but she, you know, she was like, oh, you could come work with us full time. There's one town in Connecticut that has a lot of Brazilians. And it was $11 an hour to work as a court interpreter full time. Um, so even as a, even as a master's student, it was far away too. It's like that was not very interesting proposal. I don't think their rates have actually gone up that much in Connecticut, mm. um, and in Massachusetts, if you're not certified, they're not very high either. Um, mm. So it is quite different among the states how that works. Um, and then yeah. yeah, I think I think in the UK everyone knows the story of the kind of court interpreting going to a single contract. Um, the interesting thing is that there, there has been a differentiation between um, sign language interpreting, where our sign language interpreting community historically has been very, very good at standing up for their rights. There's uh, a shortage, so they have the advantage that they have a lot more negotiating power because they're very difficult to replace. Um, and then when you get to spoken language interpreting, you have the official national solution and then the solutions are sometimes cobbled together on the ground because the national solution doesn't always work. Um, and so Scotland has always done its own thing, but is on a centralised contract as well. England and Wales have a centralised contract. Sometimes police forces will have their own contract. So you could have someone seeing you know, three or four different interpreters on the way to as they go through the process. And again, in, in the UK, I think like Germany, our borders of uh, court, conference, business, Conference and business, they're pretty porous. Conference and court, less so, but it depends. Um, certainly the expectations are that the qualifications would be different for the two. But every interpreter that I know in Scotland is an interpreter and, or apart from maybe one, is an interpreter and something else. So they'll be an interpreter and the translator, an interpreter and the teacher, an interpreter and the lecturer. And so that kind of makes the borders porous anyway because they'll be doing interpreting and they'll be doing something else or they'll be doing more than one kind of interpreting. Yeah, maybe at this point we can we can have a first uh, input from the audience. Uh, Judy has volunteered to, because there was a little, I don't know if you followed the chat there, there was a bit of a discussion going on there about the use of remote uh, in courts. So Judy, if I can just bring you in for a second and you can maybe show, share your experience. 
Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, hi. Judy, Judy Jetter. Hi. Um, that great discussion. We're talking a little bit about in the chat about remote interpreting for the courts. And uh, I'm sure Melinda will want to talk about how her court is absolutely leading um, the country in some of these remote interpreting efforts. Um, and I've actually had the pleasure of going to New Mexico and trying it out. I was a little skeptical. But it does work remarkably well. I've sat in Melinda's office and in the specific <laughs> office they have for <laughs> for this, and um, it sounds kind of hard to believe that it works with two phone lines and um, an old interpreting console for Simul. But it does work, and it allows you to bring remote interpreting services to to um, states that may not be able to have an interpreter otherwise. So I think that was a pretty meaningful way to do it, and. Yeah, some kudos back to New Mexico for all the amazing stuff you guys are doing in terms of remote interpreting and lots of other things too. Thank you. So um, I wanted to quickly say that ASL interpreters in the United States are also differently situated um, from court interpreters, even when they're ASL interpreters who work in court. And the difference is ASL interpreters in the United States have a requirement to have at least a degree uh, before they are even allowed to take the test. Um, community interpreters, court interpreters, medical interpreters have no barriers to entry to the position, um, to the profession, sorry. You could be somebody who has never studied interpreting and never even went to college, but you happen to be very talented and you happen to pass the exam and you would be an interpreter. It's very hard to pass an exam without having any formal education, but it's doable and it's possible here. But for ASL interpreters, that is not the case. So just coming in to the game, they already have uh, certain academic credentials. And yes, um, they have um, working conditions that they've set up and uh, to pass their certification, there's all other kinds of requirements. So yes, that's a very stable segment of our interpreting market. Um, so to Judy, and it's nice to hear you, Judy. Um, <laughs> here. The uh, federal courts as well as the state courts have been uh, using remote interpreting for a long time. So initially it began because we didn't have access to certified interpreters. Um, and so Doing it remotely allowed us to use certified, qualified, credentialed interpreters in cities where yes. they did not exist in person. It also, in my particular district, we have tons and tons of cases in indigenous languages, in Quiche, in all the different variants of, of the Mayan languages. Um, and those interpreters, you can imagine, are very rare. So we definitely have to provide remote interpreting for those languages. So the additional wrinkle under COVID is that we've been doing remote interpreting at the federal level through what is called the telephonic, telephonic interpreting program. So just two phone lines, one is simul, the others can say. Works beautifully, Never, we don't drop calls, everybody knows what to do, and it's only provided by certified interpreters in the languages where certification exists. And the audio is usable because, I mean, it sounds like a like a phone line then, which is not uh, ideal. Correct. It's not it's not ideal, but it's piped into courtrooms over the loudspeakers. So that's for the record for everybody in whatever remote courtroom you're covering to hear. And it's recorded because there's a record, right? So there's a court reporter transcribing mm -hmm. or there's a recording device transcribing because you have to have a record of both the original utterance and the interpreted utterance in case there's appeals on the basis of mm. poor interpretation. Sure. You can't just not hear the original. That's one of the differences in court. Um, in the state courts, they've been using video remote for a while. There's actually a couple of providers that have made a lot of money providing um, video remote technology also to cover remote courthouses. You may have staff in the central city, like in Florida and Orlando, but there's little towns far away. And so they provide interpreting remotely. Now under COVID, I am uh, proud to say that New Mexico continues to be a leader, but we're not alone. Fresno federal courts are doing the same thing. We actually had our first mock hearing over Zoom on Friday, uh, last Friday. So I can proudly say that we're not just doing it telephonic now. Zoom is going to be probably uh, the platform that we're using to cover um, court hearings. So we are definitely going remote, but I think, I know, that one, when the crisis is over, 
Uh, we will probably not be using Zoom as much uh, because there are many hearings that because of due process and legal requirements must be conducted in person so that the defendant has access to their attorney and uh, to be present in front of the judge so that they can hear them and see them directly. Okay, great. Um, that I, I guess this just shows the sort of borders that we have between conference and, and other segments of interpreting. Because I, I know almost nothing about legal interpreting here uh, on the European side of things. And I'm, I'm not sure how remote, uh, if, if we're using remote at all in legal systems. I don't know. Jonathan, have you heard anything through ITI about the situation in the UK, maybe? Especially with the migrant situation we've been having? I'm not entirely sure. I know there has been some research on remote interpreting in the UK done by the Avidicus group. Part of their research covered that. I think now with COVID-19, everything's up in arms anyway. And so I'm not entirely sure what's going on there. I would need to kind of chat to some colleagues and see what's happening. I do know the UK government were looking at remote, but if you think about the the issues that you had when you were doing and when they were doing another national contract it's an extra complication i think the reality is to go back to some of the discussions that we've had on remote in, in the past and i'm sure say will back me up on this the reality is the spread of interpreters doesn't match the spread of the need of interpreting in most countries and it, i think for things like court interpreting where it's a case of do you delay the trial or do you wait you know do you wait for someone to come in or whatever I think remote interpreting is going to have a place even after COVID-19 at the moment. It's basically what has to be done in, in many cases. I don't know how it's being done, what's being done. Certainly the UK government are trying to reduce trials as much as they possibly can at the moment. Um, so yeah, the, the short answer is I don't know. The long answer is I think it's going to have more of a presence in court interpreting since the spread of interpreters really matches the spread of the need of interpreting exactly. So am I hearing and understanding correctly that in a lot of your either states, provinces, or countries, the, the services that are provided in the courts, and I do want Elena to talk about what medical interpreting is like here, but for you guys in the courts, you're getting your interpreters through agencies or a, or a single contract rather than hiring the interpreters directly? In in England and Wales, they have a central contract with a sing, one kind of two interpreting firms. In Scotland, it's a central contract as well. Um, and so what should happen is when they need the interpreters at any stage in the legal process, they call the central con they talk to the central contractor, they then send out an interpreter. What happens sometimes is that that doesn't work. And so some police forces do have their own contracts anyway. Anything kind of national, so like any kind of criminal court hearing is on central contract. But there have been cases where courts have just phoned interpreters that they know because for whatever reason, the central contract didn't work. But that so has is been the, the case. scale better if you get hired directly than if there's an intermediary? I officially no direct hiring takes place, but my understanding is that probably yes, it would be better if you're hired directly. Officially, that doesn't happen because there's a central contract and everything's fixed and blah, blah, blah. blah. Unofficially, I, I don't know any country where officially, where, uh, what is official and what is real line up perfectly. Um, certainly, I, I don't know so much about Scotland. I haven't heard so much about Scotland, but I, I, I've heard of secondhand, I've heard of cases uh, th through kind of people who know th of cases where the interpreters have been hired in ways that the contract doesn't say they should be, but they just had to be to get the job done. Yeah, I think it's quite Thank similar you. in in Germany, isn't it, uh, Alex? I don't know if you've uh, heard of, um, I think there as well, it's sort of a, a hodgepodge situation, you know, because of the different regions that we have that are in charge of their own legal systems, basically. Uh, but at least um, several years back now, I think a, a law was implemented to ensure that the payment was sort of harmonized and 
maybe not good, but uh, at least better than it was before. And I think we had a sort of a mixed system of uh, working with agencies or like police stations or, or courts working with agencies and some calling interpreters directly off, off the list of certified interpreters. So it's a really, uh, really weird mix. And we're getting similar signals here in the chat, actually. So Gunilla said that in Sweden, it's usually it usually goes through an agency, but the rates are set. Same with uh, police and attorney-client meetings. And in Belgium, Tom chimes in that there's no central contact, doesn't surprise me for Belgium, but there are databases which are now in the process of being centralized and the rate is based on central agreements and very low rates, unsurprisingly, which seems to be different in the US. So that's interesting That's interesting uh, to see because at least in Germany, I mean, legal interpreting is notoriously, you know, low paid. I don't know. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, I, w I would say in terms of rates, in the U.S., it's not known to be low. What's l known to be low with paying is medical. You know, and it's like, what are the priorities, right? It's like life and death, <laughs> legal justice system. But um, that's here in general, the lowest, you know, the lowest people on the totem pole are medical. Perhaps perhaps with the exception now of educational, because educational interpreting is something that's really emerging um and when back when i when i moved here in 2003 i was hired as a tutor um in a in a in a for a kindergartner who um was from brazil she was actually from korea and but they had been living in brazil since she was born and then they were now in the united states and i was her tutor but i was and now they're calling that interpret first they started calling it translator and then they now they're actually calling it interpreters but they yeah the pay is really low for that as well but medical medical is usually quite low and then the the, the court it'll depend and then legal is also separated because different people can do legal interpreting when you're not in the courtroom then you don't need anything yeah I'm not even sure educational interpreting is is a thing over here. I don't know, but I think the US have been uh, ahead of us there for a long time because of because you have, um, you know, regulations in place that ensure that interpreting has to be provided. At least that was my impression. The same well, for sign language and, um, and things like that. Yeah, yeah, I would. I mean, I would say. I mean, it's nice to hear that the impression is that things are better. <laughs> um, it's far away. Because, you know, I don't really know firsthand. Yeah. So. <laughs> we don't. Um, yeah, we do. I mean, we do have a series of laws. You know, we have Title VI. We have a federal mandate for anything with public services. And so um, that's why some people actually do consider legal interpreting to be under community interpreting, depending on how you, who you ask, even in the U.S., because it's when you interpret for somebody who's seeking public services. And um, I just lost my train of thought. Um, I started out by saying, what did I start out by saying? I don't know. I really You're just- You're happy gone. that we have the impression it's better. Oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Not to belabor the point. But. Right. It just completely, I couldn't believe it. Um, yeah, so I think I think that that um, we have the we have a federal mandate for it, but it's it's not funded, and that's the big thing that we talk about in medical interpreting. So yes, hospitals, clinics, any provider, any um, medical professional who receives any kind of federal funding, including like a grant or computers or something, they have to provide language access, right? So it doesn't mean interpreters necessarily, but they have to provide language access. They could use a bilingual provider. Um, they have to translate materials that are considered essential. Um, and they have to provide interpreters if it's a big enough volume um, of their um, of their population. Mm -hmm. And it's because it's basically considered discrimination and it's the federal law against discrimination based on national origin, which was then recognized in 2000 with an executive order that you really had to, that mean you had to provide language access. Um, and but ASL is much more recognized across the fields, as we were already talking about. So ASL, even in medical, is much more recognized. You know the need for it. Deaf people know their rights much more. I mean, think about it. For for medical in court, it's mostly immigrants. A lot of them are undocumented. Mm. They don't want to cause a stir. Some of them don't even know their rights. Most of them don't know their rights um, to to a right to language access, and they just won't ask for it. Um, 
you know, they don't. So it's, it, it is quite different in that sense, but I think it is stronger. I mean, mm. from what you're saying, we have that. And educational interpreting is very new, very, very new. I mean, and it's really like Catherine Allen, who's like, let's, let's, you know, let's talk about it. <laughs> yeah. And she's great. Sada, I was going to say with your research with NIMSI, are you seeing similar patterns ac across countries where you have kind of different countries and even states within countries deciding on their own solutions and then on the ground and official looking like two different things sometimes? Uh, well, I yeah, I looked into a bunch of countries for a project last year and, you know, it was like 12 countries maybe and I'm in touch with this all the time. And yeah, I definitely can say that the interpreting market is fairly messy. <laughs> you know, there's no... Um, not no standards, but there's so many different standards everywhere you look. And yeah, like you said, in um, Alex, like in in Germany, you know, every um, state does its own thing. Uh, in Europe, the countries do completely differently. Like the Nordics, I usually uh, set up really well. Um, the UK, I think, is uh, set up pretty well. Um, but then um, when I was talking to people in, in Spain, for example, you know, they don't have a lot of certifications there yet. Um, then overall, I think that from what I've seen, Europe is fairly behind when it comes to remote interpreting. I mean, there's some markets um, who have more, also like the UK and the Nordics, um, but a lot of countries where you don't have that. And yeah, well, I also sometimes think the, like when we were talking about language access again, um, the US is definitely ahead there. I mean, some European states also have great language access laws, but not like for, you know, everywhere and all these cases and like I myself once was in a um, hospital in Spain in the emergency room and I just had to get by even though I was barely conscious and there was nobody nobody spoke English there I, I speak some Spanish so I got by but it was really really difficult <laughs> or uh, at uh, my wedding in in Germany um, I am, so my husband is Irish and he doesn't speak uh, a lot of German so we had to have an interpreter um, back then I wasn't an interpreter yet and not that I would have been able to do it anyway, <laughs> yeah. but just saying, that would um, have been awkward. but it was, yeah, it's like, it's fine. Yeah. I got <laughs> yeah, we're this. getting a dog license. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, um, one of my friends, um, did it for, for us then, um, she just got sworn in on the spot. And she just needed to be bilingual. So I was like, yeah, it's, it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> so it was actually, it turned out to be a pretty funny ceremony <laughs> because of that. <laughs> we, I think yeah. we, I feel like we need to save this for a future episode somehow. That would be a good case study to investigate. But it's interesting to see that. Most hilarious interpreting. Movies. Yeah, exactly. It's interesting to see the discussion sort of in parallel going on in the chat here. So the, some of the strikes were mentioned earlier. So we, we had a few of those in the UK, of course. Um, uh, and certainly big conflicts, uh, Austria as well, more recently, uh, Netherlands just a few months ago, I guess. So I don't know if Sylvie can can chime in on that later. But uh, it's I think it's a good tie in with the next topic that we were going to get into, which is which is very high on interpreters agenda in the US at the moment, which is uh, AB5. <laughs> so I don't know how far this has sort of uh, sunk in already he uh, over here in Europe. But um, maybe Elena or Melinda, one of you, or maybe Sarah as well, I think you've looked into this as well. If you could give us just uh, the short cliff notes on what AB5 is and why interpreters should care. Yeah, I'd say I'm going to let the Americans take the lead on that because I've only uh, read about it where you guys are in it, I'd say. So. Well, you know, the U.S. is a huge country, so we're not actually in it. Uh, True. Yes. directly <laughs> uh so AB5 but it's been discussed across every all the other states as well right not just in california correct because um there's a lot of states uh, well state legislation tends to copy other state legislation on issues that are of import um, and that are significant and in this case it is so ab5 stands for assembly bill 5 um, which comes out of california most states don't call their house of representatives assembly so even that gives you clues as to the difference in culture in the u.s mm. but anyway um so ab5 is a hot topic um not just because of what it does but how it differentially impacts or differently impacts different sectors in the interpreting profession. So if you are an interpreter who mostly worked for one agency, got most of your gigs from one agency, uh, and maybe did mostly telephonic interpreting for hospitals across the United States because you work in Somali, 
you were singularly unprotected because there you'd be working 35, 40 hours a week for one employer and yet have absolutely no protections. If you became disabled, there was an accident, an injury on the job, all of a sudden there was no work, anything that other employees might be protected under, you would not have. And you couldn't pass out your cards because you have to identify yourself as only the agency that hired you. You can't go after your own business, and yet they can drop you uh, very quickly. So AB5 actually improves the lives of those interpreters. If you are an independent contractor who has a variety of clients, who is not dependent on one or two employers, who actually perhaps can command much higher rates and maybe you're even subcontracting to some of your colleagues because you already have like five great conference clients and they always call you to find the interpreter team and you're calling your the colleagues you respect to work with you and you're working something out where you either subcontract or they con- any of those arrangements that a lot of independent and contractors who are successful in operating at a high level or who own their little independent agency are going to be horribly impacted by AB5 the way that it was written because it forces pretty much everybody to be classified as an employee when you don't want to be an employee and you cannot possibly be an employee of 25 different clients that you might have, which many, you know, interpreters who work in the field may have 25, 30, 40 clients because maybe how you make a living is going from conference to conference and, you know, 10 different law firms that you provide depositions for. So yes, your stable of clients maybe is huge and it's not possible that you would be an employee of each and every one of them. So it really is affecting some interpreters in a very negative way. And for other interpreters, it's actually a very positive development which is why ATA, and now I'm speaking as a board member of ATA and not an interpreter, and I'm going to get Elena to share her views, um, had to come out with a very nuanced statement because we, the ATA, with over 10,000 members, actually represent all kinds of different interpreters. Interpreters who would benefit from something like AB5, and interpreters who are being terribly and negatively impacted by AB5. That's a very tricky situation. So in the U.S., it's a very, very complex thing, and different states are doing it differently. They already have something in place that is much like AB5 in Oregon and Washington, and they seem to have survived it, and independent freelancers, independent contractors and freelancers didn't seem to feel it was the same as what the California independent contractors are feeling. But um, I will let Elena take this one on. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> um, and I, you know, yeah, my my knowledge of AB five is is somewhat limited because I am pretty far from California. But um, and I, but I know as Melinda mentioned, although I was also typing and switching from one chat box to the other, but I didn't hear everything. But I think it's New Jersey, right? That's also thinking of a very similar one. Um, and you know, with with AB five, I think it, my impression is that court interpreters for Spanish and for other languages that are that have see a big volume because that's the big thing in the United States too is that depending on the language that you work with, it's a very different field in terms of in many things, rates, um, how you can specialize or not, whether you have two or three other jobs or not, um, you know how often you work. Um, and you know, and and where you work, and whether how much you need to specialize, and so for Spanish and court interpreters, I think it could be said that in many places it's a it's a very good thing because they were already working like employees, and this really is adds a lot of protections and benefits like a union would um, in the United States, and you know, giving them all those benefits and with no downside. But for so many other languages, it's it's just not possible. They're not making anything close to full time um, work with with one court system, and that court system can't hire you know all these employees if they're working with a language that they use once or twice a year or even once a week, right? Um, so 
I think it that was why when we when we worked on that statement, it was like we have to you know really listen to the fact that we have you know members from all types and and stripes here, and it it is it is does seem to be a very good thing um, for some people. The vast majority of vocal people that we've heard from um, don't seem to be happy with it, right? Um, but it's interesting what you were saying, Melinda, about Oregon and Washington State because. My impression of them is that there, it's also a very different field in terms of unions there, right? Um, they have their own union for, for medical interpreters, um, you know, a state union. And so they, they already have a lot more regulations and protections. Um, but, you know, it's, yeah, it's just, it's very different. Whereas AB, something like AB5 for me would, would be terrible. It doesn't make any sense at all. So what's the current status of AB5? I think it's it's technically, it has gone into effect. So it's, what would, I mean, what happens next? <laughs> any way to fix this? Or uh, I guess some people are happy with it, as you just said. For some, it's really beneficial. Um, well, it went to conference committee because it has to be Finalized, finalized between the two versions, right? There's a Senate version and there's an Assembly version. There's the higher and the lower house. And um, so it had gone to conference committee. I don't know that it's out of conference committee and been instituted as the law yet, but maybe it has. And this is, of course, a telltale sign that tells you that I'm not an independent contractor anymore, because if I was, I would be able to tell you this because it would be important to me. But as a staff interpreter, uh, this is an argument that I, I haven't kept up with other than the big general generalities, but I think, I don't think it's final yet. And if it is, it's going to be tweaked because certainly lots of fields, I mean, it's interesting. It's not just the interpreters. It's apparently like, um, you know, strippers at dance clubs and hairstylists and all these people. No, there's all these people that are covered by it who aren't yeah. going to be employees, you know, that are used to, that are independent contractors just because of the type of work mm -hmm. that they do. And so mm -hmm. we were not alone in, in, in being upset about how it was affecting our field. Right. Um, so a lot of, I think, even if it is final, which I'm not sure mm -hmm. that it is, there will be modifications made because there's lots of different groups lobbying to have changes made. Yeah, I think I think it did go into effect, and I and I I heard a lot of people talking about it, and also the agencies, the the companies are acting as if it, it's gone into effect, and so I've heard from a lot of different, especially interpreters, that are saying, you know, I can't work anymore for all these agencies. What's really active right now is this the idea of a carve out. Um, so there was a lot of law being done, but I think it did not when they, they passed some kind of carve out and they were not including interpreters and translators. And that's what the ETA really tried to um, work hard to get um, in our lobbying efforts to get us to be part of that. Because yeah, like were included lawyers. There were a lot of, you know, a lot of professions. And then, you know, like Melinda gave that wonderful example of, of strippers, but hairstylists, you know, all these other um workers that that aren't necessarily as professionalized as us um are getting a carve out and they're not included uh and 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 that's the thing too is that when you have such disparity between what's required and the type of person working in that job it's very hard to you know there has to be how can there not be a, a carve out because in effect there are so many people that are just they're pulling off the street you know and come interpret <laughs> So it, it is it is not regulated, but then to have it regulated in terms of of employment, it's just like going from one extreme to the other, right? And and uh, Judy just confirmed this. So other professions did get an exception, like freelance writers and musicians. And the idea is now to get the governor to to do this sort of carve out um, thing. And um, well, actually, yeah. sorry, I think it's the other way around. Um, I know some have gotten yeah, exactly they did not get exceptions. <laughs> Judy was just saying so. They are like freelance musicians and writers and them. They are also still affected oh, by I the see. law. Got it wrong. All. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, from what I've read as well, it's largely, you know, like um, uh, Elena was saying already, like uh, lawyers, a bunch of other um, professions that have bigger lobbies behind them that have already gotten uh, an exception. Um, whereas other professions are still fighting. I've read as well that, for example, um, truckers, um, there's yeah. a bunch who 
uh, or like who you know have uh, chosen to be um, self-employed, um, they are affected by this as well, and like a lot of professions. So definitely, interpreters are not the only okay, ones. So it, uh, it should have, yeah. I misunderstood. The freelance writers and musicians are also trying to get the exception. But it, I think it it uh, illustrates quite well with how important professional associations are. And, and maybe we can get to that with Jonathan and Alex, because you, you've both been active on boards of associations. And because we got the question here from Rebecca, how much of ATA's work is focused on lobbying? And I think we can get to that in a minute. Um, but... Um, what about ITI, for example? Is is how much how much time does lobbying take up in the association's work, and uh, is is lobbying as big of a thing as it is in the US? Well, I've been out of ITI for out of the ITI board, I should say, for the, about eighteen months now. But when I was on the board, one of the things that we realised, and I don't think we really got this message. Well, I don't think people really understood this message enough was that it's one thing for ITI with just over 3,000 members to say something. It's another thing if ITI and the Association of Translation Companies and a whole other associations in the same sector say, this is a thing. And so as I was you know, coming to the end of my term, ITI was making more more and more, doing more and more work with people like ATC, trying stuff with CI, or some other associations, to to really cement this idea that the sector can speak with one voice. And so, you know, there were always government events that people that the chair was going to or whatever, and there was some lobbying behind the scenes. We were invited to be consulted on the newest contract for court interpreters in England and Wales, and by all accounts, it just seems to have been a fait accompli by the time we were invited in, uh, we being ITI, I wasn't there. Um, but I think that, you know, as an association, ITI has realised that certainly in the UK, you, you need the entire sector to say something. And that's why I've been really glad with the, the COVID-19 statements and stuff that we'll get to in a minute. ITI has been very careful to do that with another association to say it's not just us. And I think ATA is big enough that you can have a voice just through your sheer size. I don't know if Alex G would say the same thing in Germany, that until you get to a certain critical mass, it's difficult to get people to listen. And you have to find other people whose mass that you can kind of work with to say the same thing. I think I would definitely agree with that. And I mean, Germany with the BDU, which is basically the umbrella organization for the German Association of Conference Interpreters. So the VKD, which is is that for the conference interpreters. The BDU is basically the German Association of Translators and Interpreters. Um, they have about 8,000 members and they actually have a dedicated lobbyist, like a full-time lobbyist working in Berlin. So I know for them that's a very big um, factor that they are always looking out for. I think for the VKD and also for the AIC in Germany, as you were saying, Jonathan, with uh, coronavirus being a huge factor impacting the interpreting profession at the moment, they've really come together and they've also issued joint statements. And I think that really goes across the board, not just in Germany, not just in the UK, but you can see it really all around the globe. Um, you know, AIC has issued co-statements or joint statements with uh, the Interpreters Association in Italy, with FEED. So I think it's really exactly that, getting that critical mass, showing that it's not just a handful of freelance interpreters that are suffering from this, but it is truly affecting an entire industry across the globe. And um, I think that is definitely crucial at, at this time to kind of band together and show that it's not just this one association with like 200 members, but it's actually the entire thing. And, and how much time, I mean, how much weight has does AB5 or other lobbying have right now for ATA? Because I mean, ATA does a lot of things. There are different chapters and divisions and uh, you do the conference every year. But um, is, is that a fair statement to say that almost the entire association is busy dealing with AB5 <laughs> at the moment? Because sometimes I get the impression that's the case. I'm not sure. I can, I can take a first stab at this or do you want to take a first stab, Melinda? Um, well, uh, it's it's certainly an important topic, um, and I know that a lot of time was devoted to it and is still being devoted to it because it continues to evolve with the carve-outs, mm -hmm. and I agree with everything that was said before. It actually did pass. I just looked it up I, uh, just to make sure, and yes, it did pass, and, and, and now we're fighting on the carve-outs. So ATA is certainly doing that, but ATA 
has a lot of other things that also take up its time. And so there has been the response to COVID and providing support for remote interpreting and rolling out position papers on uh, remote interpreting, which is on the works and another one that is being proposed. And uh, we have our own uh, internal issues such as whether we're going to open up our certification exam to the world at large and not require that you be a member, which is uh, also taking up a lot of our energy and our time. So AB5 certainly is important um, and it has and will continue to be important, but we have a lot of other issues that are also on the front burner. Uh, and so our president and our president-elect, I think, are really uh, having to devote a lot of time to ATA work, much more than if they had been in their positions a year ago, uh, because a lot of stuff is hitting the fan at the same time. That's actually, that's yeah, and and I would I would echo what um, Melinda said, and and we we deal with so many different issues at our board meetings that sometimes. Um, I don't even remember everything. And Matt actually reminded me that we recently changed the government relations committee to to advocacy committee um, for this reason. I think to to emphasize to our members and even internally that we advocacy is something that we want to do more of. And and as a board, that was something we had a really good discussion on our mission. And and um, as part of that discussion of the mission, it came across that the current board really wants to to focus on advocacy. So I think it's a and, and it became it's an more of an emphasis, right? And it's an important distinction, right? Because um, yep. advocacy and lobbying uh, have very different uh, connotations in the United States. And there are certain regulations. Um, we're not under them necessarily because we're a professional organization and we're not a non-for-profit. But for not-for-profit uh, organizations cannot lobby hmm. And uh, we're not that. We're a professional association, so we are allowed, but then you have to tease out the money that you devote to lobbying because that's not it, – it's just a very convoluted thing. And so advocacy is perfectly permitted by all professional associations because that's what you exist to do. So we call it advocacy, meaning I can do it and Elena can do it and our president can do it and we can put out statements and we're doing advocacy on behalf of our members. And then lobbying, which is a much more sort of pointed mm -hmm. term yeah. – uh, that is sometimes performed by paid lobbyists. We do a little bit of that as well through the JALC, uh, but um, we, the board and our chapters and our divisions uh, have been empowered to, yes, we do advocacy. ATA is here for its members. That's awesome. That explains because I was talking recently about the importance of PR in the interpreting sector and it was people from the US who went no no hold on you need professionals to do that and your understanding of advocacy is very close to my understanding of PR which now <laughs> explains where the difference came because for me PR is reaching any public that could have a, a stake in interpreting that could be interested in interpreting and improving your relationship with them and I think that's quite a UK view of PR because in the US I think you see PR as the press the media Yes. Um, and that explains now where the differences are, whereas in the UK, um, certainly when I was still on the ITI board, we realised that the rest of the world and, if you like, the, the rest of the stakeholders don't necessarily understand interpreting that well. And that's very clear when it comes to big national contracts. And so there was a, a realisation that, yes, the government need to hear the message, the media need to hear the message, the public need to hear the message, the schools need to hear the message. And that's just one thing. And it's what you're calling advocacy, what I would naturally call PR. That makes a whole lot more sense now. <laughs> it's all about context, right? <laughs> oh, glad. And we, and we have a committee for that, too. Yeah. <laughs> we have a PR committee, <laughs> membership committee. <laughs> when you become an ATA member, you probably are, you can join a committee. Here's your elevator pitch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it shows the importance of associations. And, and Tom just underlined this as well in the in the chat that he hopes this may be one of the good things coming out of this crisis. And that's, I guess that's our, our next topic right there is that interpreters in general realize that they, you know, need this kind of solidarity. And it's, it's an opportunity as well for uh, the professional associations to show, um, how did you put it, what they are made of and what they can mean to their members. I think that sums it up very well. I actually have a nice 
segue into the next topic since we announced yes, segues. We you know? um, <laughs> yeah. um, so I just heard from uh, from my boss uh, told me this week that one of his friends um, who lives in California, who is an interpreter, uh, wanted to um, do some uh, over the phone interpreting now, especially during the crisis as well. And that all the larger agencies just refuse to take on interpreters from California because of the all the ones she contacted anyway the really big names um I won't say the names but you know you know the big ones um yeah because of the AB5 uh, law so that sounded I mean I guess it shouldn't have come as such a surprise to me but in the first instance I was a little bit shocked that they you know don't even consider people there anymore then and this is my segue into (laughs) COVID-19. (laughs) <laughs> that was about as obvious as it gets. Yes. Best segment ever. <laughs> S- Sarah, you're definitely de- you you've been one of us since January with a segue like that. You're definitely one of us now. <laughs> but, but so so I'm gonna i I'm gonna start the ball rolling because I've had quite an odd journey with COVID nineteen. Um we've been discussing it in the kind of troublesome terp slack recently. Um before COVID nineteen, I don't know if anyone remembers before COVID nineteen was a thing. With it, there was this little tiny uncontroversial thing in the UK called Brexit. I don't know if anyone ever heard someone discussing that. Is and, that still um, going on? Is that a thing? I wish King it was. I don't actually know what's happening with that. Um, and what happened is Brexit took me to the point where there were months where there was just no work. And I would contact my kind of favorite agency clients who were good at sending me work and they would say, we don't have any work either. And I would do all the things to get myself work. And the the outcome was... No one has work right now because of Brexit and whatever. And so I good probably from January, um, January, February, I had to real I realized it took I was a bit slow on the uptake, but I realized kind of in January time that if I don't do something about this, I'm not gonna have any income. And so I was realized I'd had a history of doing other things, doing paid writing and stuff. And that then now, only now from kind of January-ish, is that beginning to pay off and I'm beginning to see consistent streams of, of income from that. And so I became not COVID-proof, but much safer from the effects of COVID-19 than I was before. And now I'm in a point where I can, you know, I'm going to be signing up for more and more remote interpreting stuff for that to come in. But Brexit gave me the training to do the stuff that I'm now glad I'm doing so that during COVID-19, I've still got work coming in. Um, I think in the stronger interpreting markets, kind of Paris, Brussels, Munich, where interpreters ha- probably haven't ever needed a second stream of income, COVID-19 is probably having a much bigger impact. I don't know if that's right, Alex G, or because my impression was the interpreters who had the biggest flow of work before are the ones who are struggling the most now. Struggling in the sense that everything has been cancelled and they just don't know what to do with themselves? Struggling, struggling in the sense of the biggest income drop and the biggest need to go, well, what now? Yeah, I guess I would agree. I mean, I'm hoping that if you had the biggest income in the first place, you probably have a lot of savings and are therefore able to weather the storm. That's kind of what I'm hoping for everybody. Um, but I do agree if I think there was also, this was also a discussion going on in the chat that not a lot of interpreters are just doing 100% exclusive interpreting and nothing else. But I actually know quite a few people who do just interpreting. I'm one of them myself. And that initially was an extremely hard hit when everything just all of a sudden got canceled. And it was pretty much in the span of a week. You know, I started with one job and you were thinking, oh, that's just a fluke. It's just that one client. But then over the course of a week, maybe a week and a half, maybe two weeks max, just everything got completely wiped off the calendar. Um, I had a colleague who who also joined the webinar. He said it looked like um, you had some Tipex. If you're from Germany, you know what that is. It's like that little, the the whiteout. Um, it's like a bottle of Tipex with whiteout just spilled on your calendar and everything's just gone. Um, I think it's sort of starting to, I mean, in the, in, in the initial phase when everything got canceled, that was obviously horrible. Then there was sort of a quiet after the storm, and now I'm feeling like the clients 
who would obviously book you in the first place are sort of starting to come back out of their paralysis and are realizing, okay, the world is still spinning. We still need to do stuff. We need to do a town hall to inform our employees. We need to do a web stream to do this. We need to do a press conference to do that. So I feel like it's slowly starting to pick up very, very slowly in very, very small ways. So not at all comparable remotely (laughs) uh um, to what it was before. But I mean, the only way is up, honestly. Like if everything is canceled, even one job a month is great. So I feel like that's kind of the situation that we're in at the moment. And I'll just leave it at that and see where we take it from here. What did it look like on the state side, basically? <laughs> did, did you hear from from colleagues? Or I, I guess your your own experience as well is um, I'm assuming that courts and and I don't know about hospitals actually. That could be interesting. How that changed the the situation. Yeah, it's it's different on both things because I know I was actually surprised um, when Melinda Melinda said she was still working because I know in Massachusetts, what it, I guess it's the state courts they shut down a lot of things, a lot of the non-essential. I think it was just the serious criminal cases that they were still holding hearings for. Um, so it it might there once again it might depend on the state in terms of who's doing what medical um medical has changed even though medical in the united states was um already mm, i don't know not 50 percent, but a lot of it is done remotely um either over the phone or video um remote and what i've heard from several different hospitals is that they're they're moving their interpreters remotely even even one in cambridge massachusetts that had its own call center in the ho- in one of their hospitals right it's a big system big healthcare system they had a call center that their own interpreters their employees would go to and re- interpret over the phone and in video and even those interpreters have are now interpreting from home um, on the same system, but they're they're not even going into that call center because they were all in cubicles too close to each other. Um, but it's and then I've I participated in the two um, big online events here the the gala um, the gala online event and then the Interpret America Summit and um, and I, I led a workshop too and the with with um some some other interpreters that are looking to go remote and it, most of the comments um are pretty doomsday i mean everybody seems to be just really scared and you know like what, what are we ever going to get work again and you know i lost i mean in the income loss i don't remember the numbers but that they they did a, a poll in that interpreter america summit which had 600 700 people answering each poll and um, some people were losing in the millions, but those must have been the companies. But I want to say most people were losing between five thousand and ten thousand. Had already lost five thousand and twenty five thousand dollars in income. Yeah, that sucks. Yes, Pretty dire. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, definitely. Uh, like mm-hmm. uh, we at NIMSI, uh, of course, have looked into the effect on the language services market and. Um, a lot of the language services are um, kind of impervious to crisis because there's a lot of uh, remote work happening already. And, you know, whether things are going well or not so well, things always need to be translated one way or another. But the interpreting market is one of the sectors that has been like that is very, very affected by the crisis. Mm. So I've, I've spoken to a few companies now in this sense, but in different uh, countries across the globe. Um, this is still ongoing research that I'm doing right now. But uh, just for a quick overview is that companies that have been working on site, of course, have seen a, a huge loss right now. So there are some that have lost more than 50% of their business now already mm. and uh, had to fire lots of people because there's just no income. Then others are trying, like, are struggling to try to get their clients to remote solutions and to offer what they can. Whereas on the other hand, again, the whole um, virtual interpreting technology companies with the, you know, ours platforms and BRI and OPI solutions, they are, well, actually not OPI so much, but uh, they're busier than ever. <laughs> they have all reported back to me that it's a madhouse for them because um, businesses are contacting them like, please give us something so we can keep going. So it's a real like interesting situation uh, to see. And I'm wondering what the outcome will be. We can only speculate right now um, what it will be after, what it will be the effect on the interpreting market as well. 
it's interesting looking at the comments, how many people are saying all the conferences are cancelled, kind of moving people moving into translation and stuff. And in some cases, you know, different providers being called in because they do remote solutions and, and the, the other provider don't. It's really fascinating for me how much of interpreting we had assumed um, that we were always going to be able to be in person. I know I've said that myself, you know, in person will never go away. Well, right now it's it's gone for now. Um, and I've also heard a couple of colleagues saying that they signed up quite early for the remote interpreting providers and haven't really seen the busyness of the remote interpreting providers reflected in their workloads. I wonder if the remote interpreting providers for the moment are kind of leaning on the interpreters that they already know. And those of us who, who are registering might not, well, probably not on the top of the list because if there are people who were, who jumped into this really early, of course, they're going to get the first shout at work. Um, it'd be interesting. I, I like this idea of what's it going to do long term. I think there will be kind of a relief thing of at some point when in-person conferences come back, I could see a wave coming back. But there is now going to be an awareness among some companies that you can do certain things remotely and you don't need an interpreter in the room if it's, you know, chatting to a supplier about when the order's coming in. And to be fair, we maybe should have thought of having some of these conversations with them earlier. But COVID-19 is just kind of making the decision I was for just going to actually make that controversial remark is whether we as interpreters have been dragging our feet too long or just refusing to uh, fully engage with remote. And now we kind of have to do it. So it's all a bit messy. So I don't know, just putting that out there. Uh, but uh, Tom said in the, in the uh, chat there as well that he has the impression some clients may not be ready for remote either. Um, so there you go. Yeah. So I was going to say that um, this is a huge hit and it's a huge hit because of um, the assignments that have actually canceled altogether, right? So there are some assignments that continue, like the courts. The courts continue because there are people that are close to ending their sentences and so they want to get sentenced and, and want to sentence them and have these people leave and not be incarcerated where they are at higher risk. Initial hearings, which is what we call them in federal court, when they catch people committing some kind of federal crime, like selling drugs, they're still going to prosecute those people. Mm. So there are certain areas of work that will continue everywhere because they're considered essential. And so those of us that serve those clients, whether we be in-house or not, are providing those services remotely or, I mean, they're coming up with crazy solutions. Like in Colorado, they put all of the defendants in one courtroom and then all of the judges and the court personnel in another courtroom and they connect the two courtrooms via video. Uh, others are doing it telephonically. We are trying Zoom. So that continues. I'm concerned for all of the legal depositions, for all of the conferences mm. that were just canceled altogether because then that's going to no one, whether they were, mm. you know, had enough foresight to get ready or not. Um, and like many of you have expressed, I don't know how many of the clients that will now experience remote interpreting by force or not at their own choice will come back to in-person interpreting. Some of them will undoubtedly want to go back to in-person mm. interpreting because it's the much better way to deliver the particular service they need. But many of them, I think, are not going to once they experience mm. that Zoom is great and that maybe it's safer. I don't know, the police interrogation. I don't know. There's, uh, there's all kinds of places where mm. Zoom might work better. And if so, for us here in the United States, one of the lines that I want to hold up, which I hope will come out in the ATA remote interpreting position paper, mm is that we hold the line on the credentials and the qualifications of the interpreters. I don't know what it's like in Europe, but what's happened in the US is that remote interpreting has always been a source of work for people who have no credentials and no qualifications because the agencies that provide the technology and the platform usually also <laughs> do the contracting of the interpreters. Hmm. And they choose to hire cheaper interpreters because that improves their bottom line. Mm. And if we're going to have more remote interpreting, I hope ATA and we interpreters and all the interpreter associations are going to be fighting for, okay, we're going remote more than we thought we would, a lot faster than we planned mm. for, but 
we have to maintain the credentials of the interpreter that's on the other line of whatever platform you're using, because otherwise our profession, or not just our profession, whoever's listening to us is going to have a completely different experience and inferior service. So I think that's where we have to be thinking ahead. I don't know where it's all going to land, but I just hope we interpreters can quickly reinvent ourselves and hold a line. So I had the honor of helping to draft the ITI position paper on remote interpreting. And that's a line that we very clearly took was we set out, here's where remote interpreting is, here's what it's currently used for already. I think it's important that associations are honest with the good uses of remote interpreting, including, and I know I'm going to get in trouble for this, remote from home is being used and is being used well in many cases. Um, so we say, you know, here, here's what it's being used for. Here's the research on the dangers of it. And so here's our position. And our position was very much the qualifications and standards expected should be the same. There has to be equal, if not greater, monitoring of interpreter mental health. And yes, it is the, if you like, the responsibility of the person hiring that they know something's going, you know, if you're hiring a lot of interpreters, it's your job to do something about mental health. You can't just throw it on someone else. And we need across the board, across the entire sector, we need association researchers and providers and buyers all around the same table saying, let's get this right. And I very much take a pragmatic position, which is people are going to do this anyway. Let's get it right. Um, you know, people are going to drive cars. Let's give them, let's have a licensing thing. You know, people are going to do this stuff. If we stand up like a King Canute, we have a legend of a, a king in the UK who kind of sat on the seashore and told the waves not to come in. If we do a Canute thing, we're going to get blown over. But if we say people are going to do remote from home, okay, fine. Uh, we might not like it, but here's what you need to do. People are going to do remote in, remote in different situations okay let's work out what the best way of delivering that is rather than saying we don't like this we don't like that we don't like that just create a line and say here's how to get it right however you do it um i just wanted to make a quick comment i know we we want to um, ask the attendees about this as well but you know i just and i agree with everything that's been said i think one um, one wrinkle into it is that I, for, for remote interpreting, I was ready and I've been working on it for the past year to be ready to kind of get ahead, because knowing how much resistance there is on behalf of a lot of interpreters, especially um, conference interpreters. But, you know, the clients still aren't ready. And so I've, I've had a client that I've been trying to convince for certain, some of their events to do it remote because their event was remote already, but they still wanted the interpreter to go in to, you know, their headquarters and they're still not ready. And then now they came back to me and I was like, yeah, let's do it. And they still don't want to pay for the RSI platform. Um, so for the, yeah, for, so for the short meetings that you were talking about, Jonathan, it, um, it's still, we see it, we see it for, oh yes, maybe we could expand and find more business and find more work in meetings that even weren't using interpreters before, but at the same time, the, plat the good platforms in order for them to ensure that quality, they still cost several hundred dollars for an hour, you know, to use them. Um, plus the interpreter, right? So um, I just wanted to, to mention that, that it's the clients still aren't ready. And so what are they doing? Zoom, which I'm, I had two tech rehearsals for a Zoom RSI, which is tomorrow and neither tech rehearsal worked at all. Um, I heard the French interpreter while I heard the panelist. Um, and the other one's going to be in Microsoft Teams and it'll be consecutive. Good luck. <laughs> well, I, I could only add to that quickly that I, I've seen, so I, for NIMSI, I look into virtual interpreting technology and there's just so, so many different solutions out there. And so there's a, such a wide spectrum of how it's done and what you pay and how professional or not it is and how they select interpreters and all that kind of stuff. So it's a little bit of a jungle, which is also why I'm weeding through it to provide a better overview and people can check it out. Um, but yeah, I, I'm fully sure that some of it will stick around and some of it will fade away again. So depending on what the outcome is, but I agree with Jonathan that in the way it's we said it before, in the end, it's a bit of a mix. The market also kind of decides what will happen, right? What is already happening. So we can at least get ready for it and try to contribute um, for to protect the interpreters and the end client as well. Um, and now that we all discussed this amongst ourselves here, I would like to open the floor again to our lovely attendees. Um, 
anyone who wants to talk about their experience so far with COVID-19 in any country, any personal experience, uh, I actually don't see who raises their hand. So Alex, you have to <laughs> sure. please I <laughs> let me know. Yeah. <laughs> or, oh, exactly. So I don't, yeah, Maria, I'm going to give you the floor. Go ahead. First of all, uh, thank you so much to all of you uh, for setting this up, to Elena and Melinda. Um, it's been really constructive for me to hear all of these experiences, especially from people on the other side of the pond, which is a reality that I don't have that much access to. Um, I live in Alabama. <laughs> right. Things are always late here. Everything comes later. And it, it doesn't matter how globalized you are. It's Alabama. Um I my particular experience, I, I I've very recently got initiated into conference interpreting. So I, I don't have a lot of jobs as it is, but the one that I had, which is very well paid by the way, compared to what I usually make, of course, got cancelled. Um and for the rest, it's a very complex thing because the hospital that we work with, our local hospital has two contracts, one for inpatient services for interpreters that work with inpatient uh, patients, uh, so to say. Um, and then another contract, which is the one that I work with, which is for outpatient settings. And of course, these tend to be less essential services, such as therapy or um, consultations, except if it's a very big post-op or something like that, it's going to get canceled or postponed until you know, it, it can be done more safely. So that has meant for me that from working four days a week, we're going to this week in which I have one day with only two appointments. Um, and I thank people like Judy for letting us know that we need to have an emergency fund for rainy days, because this is certainly what the description, the epitome of a rainy day or month and like I said earlier, I have one translation project. Um, I'm, I'm very lucky to be able to translate and to be able to um, provide a service that I think is of quality uh, because of the education that I have and because of the education that I continue to pursue, which is, I think, an important part of being a professional. Uh, but I have one project this this month. Next month, I really <laughs> don't know. Oh, yeah, that sounds tough. And yeah, completely uh, logical what you're saying as well, um, that the outpatient appointments would be uh, the ones get that get scratched first mm. because they're more often non-essential. Um, all right. Interesting. So um, can I interest any of the others in uh, speaking up, as it were? <laughs> Tom or Jose, you've, you've instigated quite a few discussions on Twitter, so here's your chance to <laughs> follow up on that. <laughs> we have, uh, yes, Tom, here you go. Yes. Um, good evening to all. By the good way. evening. And thank you for the for both of the podcasts for setting this up. But this is this is very interesting. Both the talk and the entire chat room, which yes, is very busy. Is. <laughs> um, <laughs> very. <laughs> so indeed, Alex, I did share my reticence about remote simultaneous interpreting in a Twitter thread uh, two weeks ago, I think. Um, but there's, there's this narrative that interpreters, uh, they are Luddites, really, uh, who are not ready to for technology and they don't want to uh, try it out. Uh, and I think that's unfair on interpreters. Um, because all of these fancy websites of the platforms, uh, they promise uh, a great life where you can have your breakfast with your family, uh, do a couple of meals meetings uh, in one day, and maybe even earn more than having a full day paid for on-site interpreting. And they are just selling uh, a fantasy, because that does not exist in my experience. I have yet to receive the first offer for remote simultaneous interpreting, let alone that I would be able to combine three meetings in one day and earn a living through remote. Um, so. I feel that there's a lot of talk about remote, uh, but there's very little remote uh, actually being offered to professional freelance interpreters. Um, I don't think that the tech is there yet. Um, 
And uh, I, I haven't done the jobs yet, but I've worked with voice. I, I've tried it with voice box. So I've been on several Trudeau webinars. Um, uh, so I, I, I did try them out and I was never convinced by any of them. Um, one issue I have with them is that you have to now, at least you'd have to be able to do it from home. Uh, and then with the kids home now, especially because we're all uh, at home and uh, homeschooling the kids while we are interpreting. Um, that seems like a, a, a big challenge for me. And I think that that is one of those things that um, interpreters are expected to invest in that, in their soundproofing, their room or their office where they are uh, interpreting from home. That's a huge challenge. And then... Um, Offering these interpreters a pay by minute or a pay by the hour, uh, where you expect the first hour to be paid as much as the seventh or eighth hour, uh, that is just unfair because how can you expect interpreters to invest in a computer, in a headset, in soundproofing their home office when you want to pay them less, really? Um, so that's why I am reticent uh, and it's it's not the interpreters who are Luddites. It's also because the tech, I think, is not ready to deliver the same quality we are used to delivering on site. And no, not obviously with COVID-19, because this is not a regular situation. This is not the regular market. This is not how jobs come in now. Now we have to adapt and we, we have to find ways to still service our clients uh, because they might still have to have their meetings. Um, and we don't want them to resort to English only, for example. Uh, they'll have to do that now. I think that many clients now, they are still scrambling. I mean, they uh, have to switch to remote, uh, working remotely uh, overnight as well, just like we have to do it, and they are not ready. And that's also why the new requests for new meetings are not coming in yet. Yeah, and I, I guess... But that's just my two cents. Thank you so much for sharing that, Tom. And I think you're absolutely right. That's sort of the dilemma I think we all have now, both freelancers and staffers, staff interpreters, by the way, is how, I mean, what are we willing to accept for now and how we can, how do we make sure if, if it's possible at all that this is just, you know, a temporary uh, thing that we're doing and, and can we really go back to normal after all? I mean, that's that's the big thing that we don't know. And that's the, the dilemma that we're facing right now. Absolutely agree. Now, if, if I, I just... To clarify, I am not against remote, and I think that now we have to try and make it work also for our clients so that they can keep meeting and have their meetings in their mother tongue, uh, because if they switch to English only, that leads to a power difference as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that's unsafe and unhealthy, and it's not good for innovation or the debate or to find solutions for this crisis. Yeah, exactly. I, I think. Um just looking by the chat, the UK situation is slightly unique and is that even if we had hubs, and I'm not aware of any in Scotland, we wouldn't be able to use them right now because the government have said, unless you're an essential service or you're in construction, stay home. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where trying to understand what's going on. So I, I think I, I can see the, the possibilities of working from home if it's right. And I think certainly I've got a, an Ethernet to USB connected in my laptop right now that I can, that I can rig up if I need P, if I if need be. I think there's possibilities there, but I agree with you that the resistance to remote hasn't been because we're Luddites, but because either there has been overclaiming and let's face it, a lot of interpreting technologies from remote and speech translation overclaim. Yep. To Waverly mess. Labs, right? <laughs> I, I've written on them just a few times. <laughs> um, to also, I think, the research that came out that has been consistent saying actually there are quality issues with remote, no matter how good the tech is. So there's been a lot of things, there's been a lot of concerns and that I, have, that I don't think have ever been adequately addressed. Now with COVID-19, basically, if we're going to interpret, we're going to be interpreting remotely fine. Um, and, you know, how you keep a two metres distance in a hub is another good question. But, you know, now that we're that we're going to have to interpret remotely if we're interpreting at all, it is this question that Alex said of what, what we're going to accept now and what we're going to say that's only an extremist. And what are we going to say? Well, actually, you know, personally, I've got my kids at home all the time because we've been doing home, home education for years. You know, I would be quite, I would be more comfortable taking on, you know, a one-two-hour job from home than an all-day job. 
Um, and it's like, where, where are you going to draw the line? And would there be a job that would be so amazing that I would say okay to all day that I would not? You know, it's finding where the lines are going to be drawn and making difficult decisions that you may not be able to go back on as easily in five, six months' time. But I think it's also a very interesting discussion that is going on. And I think, Tom, you mentioned that, that all those ads that are glorifying, you know, have breakfast with your children at home, you know, just hang out with the family and still make a living. Those were basically ads for what I always think of as glorified call centers, because they were always, as you said, a lot of them were charged by, you know, the minute or by the hour. And I think at the moment, we're seeing a real paradigm shift as just the conferencing space has just completely been eliminated by coronavirus. And so now there's a need for actual conference interpreting. And I think it's not necessarily the market has shifted in this way. It's just that the clients are faced with this harsh reality. They're currently scrambling. They have to cancel all these events. They're not even thinking of interpreters at the moment because, you know, they're just trying to see if their company can survive this. But eventually there will be the need to have, I don't know, a town hall, a press conference, a board meeting, you know, a conversation with their, with their suppliers or whatever it may be. And they will realize that, oh yeah, hang on, we did need those interpreters. And that's not that glorified call center. That's a meeting they might've had in the past and they need an adequate solution for that. Yeah. And that's why I think that has shifted. I do fully agree that um, the technology for online just isn't there at the moment. But the thing is, it just has to work somehow. And and Julia keeps uh, talking about the uh, the hubs. That is definitely in Germany a reality now. A lot of the, um, well, actually two of the equipment providers have um, sprung up hubs throughout most of the country. And I've been fortunate enough to be work to have already worked in one that worked quite well. But again, that's a situation where you also have to work with the clients because just it, because we're in a hub and as she was saying, you can still have a two meter difference in a hub with two separate booths. Um, that all works fine, but you still need to find a solution, te a technological solution that works for the client. And I think a lot of that stuff in the long run will move back into on-site meetings or like live meetings. But I think a lot of the smaller meetings might not. And if it's more convenient for the client, more cost efficient, and if it works for us, for everybody, I mean, for the client, for the listeners and for the interpreters, then I actually don't see a huge issue in why that shouldn't be the case. You know, if we have, I don't know, a two hour pre-alignment call for a board meeting or whatever, I don't necessarily need to go there if there is an adequate solution where everybody can do their job. And I think, Tom, that goes to what you were saying as well. If that technology exists, if they can all of a sudden spurred by, by COVID-19, if they can make that really work for everybody, then sure, why not? Yeah, then I'm absolutely. happy to make that investment as well. Yeah. 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 And I don't think that there's any reticence. Well, there are some uh, colleagues who are not that tech, tech savvy and who might not be the first to make that jump. But I think that uh, there's many interpreters who know how to use a computer, know what a good headset uh, sounds like and how much that should cost or shouldn't cost. And yeah, uh, that you need a good internet connection. Um, that's feasible. It's not that we don't want to, but we haven't found those solutions to service these two hour meetings yet. I think. Fully agree. So what would that solution look like? <laughs> That depends on the client's expectations. Might not be the same for all. It's not the same for all clients. Yeah, and I, I th if I could, I think that the solution for the shorter meetings, you know, the the downside of using something like Zoom, which has kind of a partial interpreting module in it now, is that it wasn't. It really wasn't implemented with us in mind at all, and yet it's costs hardly anything to the to the companies you know it's just a subscription to zoom i think it's a, a business or enterprise level it's not i don't even think it's a hundred dollars a month um but it really like you cannot talk to the other interpreter um i mean it, like i said in the rehearsal it wasn't working at all anyway um and you know that 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 could be the solution to have a provider that every I mean no everybody's talking about Zoom. It's like there's no other way to communicate suddenly. It's like Zoom, 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 um, which good for Zoom and they are a very good platform, um, as we all know. But I think the fear is that now Zoom is the only one. Well, it must not be the only one. Didn't Skype try this too, or was that just automatic translation? You know there. The, they've added this module and I think the fear is that it's like everybody's just going to try it with that module and 
it's really, I don't think you can have two interpreters. I think it's just solo interpreter, but multiple languages, but not teams. Some, some VIT solutions integrate um, with um, platforms like Skype, for example. So you have the, you use the platform from the VIT provider and they can integrate with any web solution that you want. So this is more just like a channel then through which you can receive the interpretation. Right. So like an audio, it's like an added audio Could even channel. be video, yeah. Yeah, or even yeah, video. Yeah, well. other sign mm -hmm. languages. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that could work. But are they affordable? I mean, are those solutions like Zoom where it's, they're basically paying nothing more? <laughs> Yeah, I, that's why I, I'm. I've kept a little quiet now, just to listen to all of this, and I'm a little bit um, confused, almost, why um, we haven't found a good solution. Um, and where was the consensus for the shorter meetings? Because I feel like I, I've talked to a lot of providers who are offering exactly that, and uh, the prices vary. But some are very affordable. Some do monthly subscriptions. Some pay per event. And again, there are so many different use cases they're targeting as well but there are a lot of solutions out there and some do it yeah again very professionally some have their hubs some um if interpreters need to work from home they assess it together with the technician to make sure that everything's set up correctly others don't but i'm just saying there's a whole variety out there um yeah if anything it's a bit too much in the market right now <laughs> um so i figured we're probably still trying to find which ones work best uh, both for the client and the interpreter some come up and others go down again but um i wouldn't say that we haven't found the solution yet maybe not not one that everyone knows and has accepted but there are so many solutions out there that some are specifically targeted for those small meetings like that yeah i think judy went to um we're just gonna say bye to melinda who had to take off for work purposes that's fine and we'll hand over the floor to judy hi everyone um just in terms of the, these the difficult times. I mean, they're hard for everybody and hard for me too. Maybe not so much on an individual basis, but I think I'm just really worrying about how this is going to affect not only our profession, but also the world. And yeah, I've been doing a lot of sort of deep thinking that obviously doesn't help my my mood about, you know, how this is going to affect the people who are in the weakest position already in this country and in many other countries around the world. So that's that's been a hard thing for me to, to kind of get through that. Because on a personal level, I mean, while work, you know, the interpreting side is gone, translation side is halved, but, you know, I've, I've got savings. I, uh, you know, I think I've got done some good planning, so I'll be okay. I'm, you know, I'm frustrated about uh, the government's response, but, but in terms of what's been helping me, I, you know, just helping others, I think, is what makes me happiest these days. So I try to do one nice thing for somebody every day, whether it's uh, writing that the recommendation letter for somebody to go to graduate school that I've been putting off, or um, calling a colleague who's a little bit lonely and doing a video chat with her, or baking some cookies and dropping them off at a friend's house, always keeping my distance. I think that's helped. And then yoga. <laughs> I discovered I don't need, need a yoga studio. Or in Zoom, actually. Do it on YouTube. <laughs> and the, or, or Zoom, exactly. I've been supporting a yoga instructor in New York that another dear colleague told me about who's now moving his business to Zoom. So I think if we can be, you know, more together and I come together as a profession and not only this profession, but everybody as humanity. I think that gives me some hope and some uh, positive views of the future because of course it will be tough. Small business mm -hmm. will be affected and, you know, I'm ordering books from small independent bookstores to help them uh, survive this crisis. But yeah, I mean, these are tough times, completely unprecedented. I think my clients are struggling to figure this out in the private legal market. I've done some, you know, poor, poorly executed over the phone, interpreting literally all consecutive for four or five hours. Uh, but, you know, I bill it at my regular rate, um, as I would do in a deposition if I'm there. So if it takes longer, I'm not too terribly upset about it. <laughs> uh, it, it just didn't work particularly well. But I think we're all trying to muddle through and come up with some solutions and I try to participate only in the solutions that I think they're somehow going to work. But some of these cases do need to be moved through the system, even though they're just civil cases. So um, most of the stuff that's criminal is ongoing one way or another, even though most of the courts have pretty much minimized their in-person interpreting. I just did one case last week 
for a case that was criminal and needed to be moved on. And yeah, so things are tough, but we're all in the same situation. Let's, let's support each other, be nice to each other, nicer than we already are. And I guess those are some of my thoughts about the current situation. Um, Back cut. to you, ladies and <laughs> we could have just We could have just stopped there. That was great. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. the, the, that was that a great was really good. That yeah. was a great ending, and it re- it reminds me of something that I've discovered in this. In that, uh, in my second book, you're talking about getting books from independent bookstores. I know a really good one, but in my second book, I make the argument that in the future, every interpreter will need to be a consultant. And what I mean by that is that every interpreter who has contact with the public will need to be the kind of person that people can rely on to get advice on how to get better interpreting. And I think this crisis is a really great opportunity for interpreters who are skilled in being able to communicate in in writing or reaching a new audience to do that and to help people see, you know, if you are a business, you can still get interpreting. It's still available. Uh, if you have a, if you want to get clients abroad, you can still do that. So I think this idea of um, coming together, working together and actually giving out really good advice as individuals, as associations at every level is going to be super important. And the clients who notice that we can do that will be the clients who come back after the crisis and say, you know, you helped me with this crazy meeting with a supplier. Can you come and do my conference too? And if we get that attitude of helping and giving good advice, I think we'll be safe. But I think equally, I want to chime into what to what you were saying, Jonathan, and also what Judy was saying. I think in these times, we also need to support each other because I know that you know we're here, we're thirty people, we're still up at it's almost eleven p.m. in in Germany. But I know for a fact that a lot of people can't be here because they actually have children. They might not be able to do this because they might have this big translation project. So I think it's times like these when you know we're all basically in uncharted territory. We're all just trying to figure out how to navigate this, and I think it's important to. <laughs> spread the love sounds a bit weird but you know if you find out something really good if you've i don't know bought a great headset if you've worked with a great platform if you've used zoom for something if you've been to a hub share with your colleagues let them know what you know because everybody knows a little bit something different and then we can sort of at the end of the day all try to figure this out together and i think this is now more than ever really important to just kind of share what you know and just be a what is it they always say oh, a bingo. community of practice is that the thing <laughs> There you go. I hope that's, Danielle, that's Danielle my little call to action. To this. <laughs> Excellent. No, but it's it's absolutely true, and I I wanted to acknowledge this um, this as well uh, because I've been following this in, for the field of online teaching and online training, especially in the field of of interpreting. It's been great to see so many teachers come together and ex- you know exchange tips and how do you do that? And this is how we do our mock conference online now, which which has been fantastic to see. So yes, I can I can one hundred percent subscribe to this and. Um, um, let's keep sharing. <laughs> Basically, uh, there are there are so many great platforms out there to do that. And um, from time to time, um, yeah, I think it would be good to collect it. I guess, yeah, collect it in, in in some central place, as some of you have done. So yeah, I think that's it. Um, I think it's probably also a good time to wrap things up now because it's really getting late, uh, at least for those in our time zone. <laughs> and uh, this, uh, Elena may, might have to go to uh, back to work. It's still in the middle of the day. So I think this, this has been a lot of fun and maybe we do this again sometime uh, in the future. Um, maybe in the not too distant future. I, I, I really enjoyed this. So I think with this, um, I would finish this session i'll actually still stick around for a few minutes so if anybody just wants to chat that's fine but those of you who need to go uh, are dismissed and this has been uh i think a wonderful joint episode of the ata <laughs> podcast and troublesome tips Last thank you all for this. joining us thank, thank you everybody. You. thank you for <laughs> having us bye everyone <laughs> <laughs>